Well, all right, so we've had some good praying, we've had some good singing, and uh, I hope when we're done you'll say we've had some good preaching. <laughs> well, good morning again, and uh, it's a great day to praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. And uh, so lots of things happening here in Wolf Creek. The Bible Club going to be starting up, Lord willing, in a couple weeks, and um uh, you know, uh, food bank this week, food pantry, I guess I should say, or however you call that. And so we just pray that, you know, we'll be able to really bless a lot of people. I know we will. And uh, and we need to keep praying for the people of Israel, right? Yeah. People of the Middle East. Uh, what conflict, what turmoil. And we got to remember, it's just not in the Middle East, so, I mean, there is turmoil in the streets of our country. There is turmoil in Canada. Turmoil in Australia, you know, thousands upon thousands rioting in, in London, right? Uh, all over the, this, uh, this new uh, outbreak of, of a long-running conflict uh, in the Middle East and Israel. When, and as we read in our scripture this morning, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the people of Israel. Because we know when there's true peace in Israel, there's going to be peace everywhere. Amen? <laughs> Because the king will be here, mm -hmm. you know, and just like in uh, uh, is it the, the uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we're uh, talking about Aslan, and uh, I forget the Minotaur, what his name was, but he told Lucy, he says, he's not a tame lion, you know, because Aslan represents Jesus. I love that scene, yeah. you know, he's not a tame lion. Exactly. People think he's a tame lion. But Jesus is not tame at all, but he shows much restraint and love and grace and patience. So let's open up with a word of prayer and we'll shift gears from the book of Acts. And we're going to think talk about Israel this morning a little bit. And what a unique uh, entity the land and the people of Israel are. Well, Father, we come before you and first and foremost, we, pray for, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace in our country. We pray for righteousness to, to reign and to roll down like the mighty floodwaters upon this world. We pray for so many people, neighbors, family members, friends, living in darkness that do not know the freedom and the liberation that comes from knowing Christ as Savior. We pray for this world, Lord. The world has a greater enemy uh, than any virus out there and that enemy is, is Satan, that enemy is sin, and, uh, and we have a, a cure that is guaranteed foolproof, better than any vaccine or any medicine. It is the balm of Gilead, it is the King of Kings, it is the Lord of Lords, it is Jesus Christ, and the shed blood that offers forgiveness and salvation and life to all who would believe. So Lord, we thank you for this time, and we just pray, Lord, that we would uh, go away encouraged, challenged, motivated in our walk of faith and our love for you and others, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right. The sleeping world was shocked, you know, eight days ago, nine days ago, um, when evil came out of the shadows. And the people in Israel, close to the Gaza Strip, suffered um, horrific <coughs> loss, okay? And for, for anyone who thinks that evil is not real, and that Satan is not alive, and, and that the, uh, the conflict of the ages is not real, you just got to look at what has happened in Israel. And it's happened, as I said, around the world. But this was something just shocking in many ways. Here, here are those of us in the West, when I say West, I'm talking about Europe, I'm talking about England, uh, I'm talking about North America. We have fooled ourselves into thinking in many ways that life is about our comfort and the, and the comfort of others and comfort is important right 
And having a good life is important, but having a good life isn't going to solve the problems of the heart and the soul and the mind. If all is well in my little world, I think that I'm okay whatever happens elsewhere. People think that way. And I think sometimes we fall into that trap because we get so focused on our issues and our problems and our needs and our comfort that we forget that there's a lot going on in the world. Complacency. Complacency in governments is a bad thing. When, you're, when a government is complacent in combating evil, evil will roll. Appeasement doesn't work. Okay? Appeasement doesn't work. But in the spiritual realm, appeasement doesn't work. If you're satisfied with, with the, the sin in your life, then you need to really examine your standing before the Lord. Are you in or are you out, so to speak, right? Today, the world is seeing something not new, but something that has historic. Historic in that it's a big impact on history, but it is nothing new. And next week I'll have a list of these things that there are dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of similar episodes afflicting the Jewish people in history uh, from the time when they were told to cast their babies into the Nile River, their males, babies, in the time of Egypt, roughly, you know, uh, what was that, about 1000 B.C.? I'd have to double-check my numbers. I didn't look that up. But for a long time, this, this conflict that, that Satan has waged on the Jews from the infancy of the nation has come upon us in a shocking, horrific um, impact, beheading babies, killing children in front of parents totally shocking unless you know what the face of evil is about unless you are, are, are aware of the battle of the ages and then it's still shocking but it's not unexpected because it has happened time and time and time again to the Jewish people and to the Christian people of the world in the last several thousand years anti-semitism we're familiar with the word but have you ever thought that this anti-Semitism is, the origins are in Satan, mm -hmm. are in Satan. God has wanted to do everything, um, excuse me, the devil has wanted to do everything in his power to thwart God's plan yeah. of redemption from the Garden of Eden. What we're seeing and witnessing and reading about and hearing and, and looking at videos is nothing but the face of the devil it's pure evil many voices many voices are trying to capture our attention today but beloved are you waiting and listening for that still small voice of Yahweh of the spirit of God whispering in your life and in your heart to help you navigate these waters Sometimes we need to stop and listen for that still, small voice. And sometimes it's silent. Be still. Be still. And know that I am God, he tells us. That works for us today in the 21st century. You know it? Okay. And I would say we all have to work at being still and being quiet. Israel, I believe, in many ways was tricked in being to content with the evil in her midst. You know, if you uh, and, and if I have my list that I, it's on my phone, so I can't use it because I'm Facebook living it. <laughs> Israel ha has been fooled into accommodating evil in its midst, and without getting sidetracked from what I really want to go, the church has been sidetracked with allowing evil in its midst. 
We've compromised. We, we, we've made appeasements to sin. And churches and denominations are fractured and fallen by the wayside because they have abandoned the truth. When, you, when, you, when you're content with evil in your midst, you can't help but expect to have chaos. Right? What can we learn from this? What well, we learn first of all that man is absolutely apart from the hand of God upon them and in his life and in her life, a hundred percent evil. And I know that's hard to understand. It doesn't go with popular opinion and popular psychology and popular philosophy. But man, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Jeremiah seventeen nine. Who can know it? And sin will harden your heart and to a degree that you can be in utter depravity unless God is active in your life. And there's many things drawing our attention away from the truth of, of God's word and, and, and that still small voice and that quiet that God wants us. And, and I'm as guilty as this as anybody at, at times, but the, this world of social media, it's corrupting the soul of humanity. Social media can be so good, can it? And it can be so evil. And we all know, if there's something good, if there's some technological advance and some invention or something that comes out that's good, we praise the Lord, right? The telephone, was it good? Yes. Families were able to communicate. You were able to talk to your mom across the country, around the world. It was great. But then how many people have been scammed into losing their life savings from telemarketers and scammers calling you up and convincing you that you should give them your bank account number? And people do it. Yeah. You know, you look at the, the, the devastation of social media on spreading hate. Um, it's crazy. You know, you go out today, social media... TikTok, I don't care what it is, most major news things, you know, or a lot of them. Um, Israel bad, <coughs> Antifa, Black Lives Matter, fascists, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, good. I mean, when you got students going to Harvard, you know, Harvard was a place at one time trained pastors, right? One of the oldest institutions. It was a seminary. It's a, still a seminary. But it's not a seminary for this. It's a seminary for hatred. And brainwashing. And on and on you could go. Christians. You know, influencers. There's a lot of influencers out there. And, and, and what is this influencing stuff done for us, really? It has told us that taking a 12-week-old baby who's about that big, fully formed, and all, all that little boy or girl has to do is continue to grow, but everything's there. You can take a 12-week-old 12, a, a 12 baby in this mom's womb and, and pull it apart with forceps. Yeah. And that's good. Yeah. There's influencers saying that's good, but that's what abortion is. Yeah. Surgical abortion. Or transgenderism. I think it was, I read something the other day in Canada, I think it was in 2022, 683 girls thought that they could become boys and had surgery. Oh, oh my God. And you're thinking, what's this have to do with Israel? Well, it has to do with truth. It has to do with what influences opinion, what influences thought, okay? Or you could go into the homosexual realm, which we open the door to that. Next thing you know, pedophilia is, pedophilia is good and false religion, Okay? So much of this social media world and, and so much of media in general today and education in general today is to take the minds of our young people and train them to hate. Train them to hate. And that's what we see playing out a lot in the Islamic world today. And I know that's not politically correct to say that. But they're trained their young people to hate. And when you got a broken heart apart from God with our sin nature, our fallen nature... You can train someone to be loving. You can train them to be hateful. But it's easier to get them to hate. 
Because that's our fallenness. That's our brokenness. That's how we're wired, apart from Christ. And I just feel so bad for the kids growing up in a culture and environment where their religion says hate, hate, kill, opposition. That's not good. What are they thinking? I don't know what they're thinking, but I don't think it's good. But it can be a force for good and for pushback. You know, there is some good stuff out there. I don't know if you listen to Dennis Prager, and this is not uh, um, selling anything necessarily, but Prager will challenge you to think in a good and godly way. Or Ben Shapiro, or James Dobson, or D. James Kennedy. He's dead, you know, but his stuff's still out there, right? Franklin Graham, Ann Grand Lotch, Johnny Erickson Tata. There's a lot of voices for good out there, but, you know, when things get crazy, it seems like only the crazy voices are heard. Uh, Jordan Peterson's another good one. You want to listen to a podcast? Listen to Jordan Peterson. He'll make you think in a good, God-honoring way. But if the Word of God doesn't rule your mind and thoughts, all we can expect is what we're getting. If you want to, turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter... And this will be about Israel. We're almost there. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to get there. And I should know myself by now if I think I got two or three messages worth of stuff. It's probably four or five. Proverbs 4 7. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. That's some good fatherly, godly advice. Wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? Or beginning of wisdom, both. Know God, you got a chance at knowing wisdom and living it, right? 423, keep your heart without diligence, for I have been on the issues of life. Now, the, I want somebody in the NIV to read that, because I like the way it says it a little better. It's a little more uh, relevant to what I want to focus on. else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart is the yeah. wellspring of life. It, guard your heart, not your physical. Well, you got to guard your physical heart, right? But the real you, your thoughts, your emotions, it's the wellspring of life. We got to know God's word. We got to know God's word. And we got to meditate on God's word if we're going to think right about. The world we live in, about the, the things that are going on, about the nations of the world and the people of the world. Turn back, if you would, to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2. So verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, nor seat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, this is what our delight wants to be. Our delight must be in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. You want to be a blessed man, woman, boy, or girl? You need to be in God's word. You need to meditate on it day and night. And that'll work. You meditate on God's word, it's going to drive that hate and anger out of your life. Okay? Psalm 19, verse 14. Psalm 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We hide God's word in our heart, we won't sin against him. Psalm 119, 11. We meditate on God's word, it's going to change us. It will be acceptable. We'll be able to tap into the strength of our Redeemer. Psalm 77, 12. Thinking about God's mighty deeds, says, I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of all thy doings. God has done great things for us. We need to think about that. We need to think about history and what he's done. And then Psalm 119, 97.
I hope you can lay your head down on your pillow tonight and, and, and pray this to the Lord. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. You know, if you take some of these psalms and some of your favorite scriptures and you pray it back to God in your own words, that'll do something to you. You won't want to go out there and uh, be stealing Twinkies from the corner market or shooting somebody just because they think different than you and worship different than you. Evil paints Israel as apartheid, racist, and seeking world dominion. Right? You've heard that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about it. How many people are in the world? Ten billion. Where are we at? We're well over six billion. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be at seven billion, you know, within a yes. decade. Yeah. So, say, there, say there's six billion. I didn't do the math on this. You know how many citizens there were in Israel, I think, in 2022? How many? Take a guess. Guess. Maybe 600. How many? 600? Well, no, there had to be more now. How many people in Israel? I don't know. You think there's more than 20 million? No. 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 Right at 10 million, roughly. Oh, really? And of that 10 million, about 72% are Jews. So there's a lot of Arabs living there. Doesn't sound like an apartheid state to me. They have the full rights and freedom to work and vote as they please, as long as they're law-abiding citizens. So let's think about Israel. Have you ever wondered why Israel is such a unique place? And... and uh, a lot of this message and the ones that come is, uh, i got to give credit to the Friends of Israel. It's from the magazines we've been getting over 20 years and, and literature I get. But, but as I talk, anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jewish people is rooted in, in Satan. The Jewish people have been persecuted more for the, and, and they've had to fight for their land more than any other group of people. And it's a small place. It's not even as big as New Jersey. It's roughly, uh, and I didn't look this up, but it's roughly about 100 miles by 70 or 80 miles wide. I think maybe 150 miles north to south. So if you figure for us here in Montana, if, if we drove from here to Billings and then went north to Lewistown and made it, that a rectangle, that would be way bigger than the nation of Israel. That would be way bigger. Isn't that something? And the whole world hates them. Wants them wiped off. That is a something. Have you ever wondered, why is Israel so unique? Well, Israel is unique because God loves Israel through the apple of his eye. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, you know, he's not happy with everything that's went on in Israel over the decades, over the centuries. It's God's conduit. Israel, you know why the devil hates Israel so much and the Jews? Because Israel is and has been a conduit for God to impact the world. God's truth has come through the nation of Israel. I think just about everybody, uh, Luke, I believe, Luke wasn't Jewish, right? I think that's right. I think Luke was a Gentile. His word came through the Jewish people. Who else came through the Jewish people? And it's humanity. Who was 100% Jewish? The king. Yes. King Jesus. Think about that. Redemption. Not to mention the law that we've read about this morning, even in Sunday school. You know, God's laws, you know, a, a framework for good moral living has come through this. The basis of our Western uh, law. And God's covenants, you know, especially to Abraham, you know. The Abrahamic covenant, the the covenant of the land, the covenant to King David, the new covenant. 
the covenant he's made with us. Come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, right? Come to me and have your sins forgiven and a na name written in the book. Amen. Why does the devil hate the Jews? Jesus. They're the people of the king. They've been scattered more throughout the world than any other people group, but yet, what nation has survived all that persecution and come back but the Jewish nation? Think about it. Nazism targeted the Jews specifically. I mean, a lot of other people got, got killed in the concentration camps, but predominantly it was a Jewish focus, right? Why do they tenaciously hold on to the land? Why are they fighting for a strip of land that they gave up after winning in the 67 war, I believe? They thought appeasement would bring peace. Chamberlain thought the same thing, and then six million people over died in, in the gas chambers of Nazi Germany. You know, why does the world hate Israel so much? The answers come from this book. Israel has a unique relationship with God. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verse 6, I'll read this. You can turn there if you want, but it says, God speaking, for, Mo for Moses speaking, okay, or, or, or God speaking to Moses, so you are, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people who are on the face of the earth. Moses told the, the, the Israelites that. God chose them. <laughs> and, and in Deuteronomy 26, 18, and 19, And the Lord hath about thee this day to be his peculiar people, people, and to make thee high above all nations whom he has made in praise and name and honor, that you may be a holy people unto the Lord thy God as he has spoken. If God tells a group of people or anyone that, that, that you're special and you're a value to him, Satan's going to hate it. Amen? And that's why, Christian, if you're not being persecuted in some way and got troubles from Satan, then you better think about what are you doing for the king? This unique relationship involves a lot of, spe a lot of special privileges. And I'm just going to kind of go through this uh, quickly here. And if you want to write down the scripture, um, and actually I'm, I'm going to order another little booklet uh, and I give it to you that will have a lot of this information in it. But Israel was adopted as God's firstborn son. Uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 and 23. Exodus 4, 22 and 23. Okay, Moses has returned to Egypt. God's been talking to him, getting him ready to go stand before Pharaoh, right? I got a job for you to do, son. People are going to love you, right? They'll follow you, no questions asked. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> but God said, And you shall say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Israel has a unique rank, is really what that Hebrew word says. A unique rank, a position above everyone else in the world and I say unto thee let my son go that he may serve me if thou wilt refuse to let him go behold I will slay thy son even thy firstborn right off the bat they were given a chance to make the right decision and told of consequences Israel is God's firstborn second Israel was permitted to hear God's voice at Mount Sinai you know they heard his voice they heard the rumblings Third, Israel saw and had a unique relationship with God is that they got to experience the Shekinah glory of God on a daily basis in the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 24, uh, verses 16 and 17. It said, in the, and this is even on Mount Sinai, And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. They saw the glory of God. They heard the voice of God. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. I mean, have you ever seen a wildfire rip up a timber, dry timber north slope with a lot of good deadfall and the wind blowing and like 
4% relative humidity, right. and it's 2 in the afternoon, and an inversion has just lifted, whoosh, man. It's, I mean, I got to admit, it's like a glorious, wonderful thing to see, but I know it's horrible, okay? But if you like fighting wildfire, it's like amazing to be on the edge of the thing. But that pales in comparison to what the Jews got to experience with the Shekinah glory and voice of God. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. It would be amazing. I mean, I can't believe Moses. You think he's like, what do I got to go up? <laughs> no, he had the faith and he was yes. called. and You know, he went up. But, yeah. you know, that's why they're unique. Fourth, he, God made covenants with them. He made covenants with them that he hasn't made with anybody else. Uh, we could turn over to Romans chapter 9, verse 4. You can listen. Paul reminds the people of his day, hey, 9, 4. He's talking about is the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption. He adopted them, right? This is a unique people. And the glory, the Shekinah glory, and the covenants. You know, the covenant of the law, the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian land covenant, the covenant with David. And the giving of the law and the service of God, just the temple service, right? For that, that, the, uh, that the priests and the Levites had. And the promises. That is why Satan hates Israel today. Even though Israel is truly not recognizing Christ as Messiah, you know, so there are Messianic Christian Jews, right? But it doesn't matter. You read through the Old Testament, God tells the Israelites over and over and over again, Hey, follow, follow what I told you to do, or I'm going to discipline you, right? Deuteronomy chapter 28. But he established covenants with Israel, and it was no other people group. Those are specific. Fifth, God gave them, uh, okay, Mosaic, Mosaic law. Six, only Israel had the worship structure. I kind of jumped ahead of myself, okay? The tabernacle, right? But the whole tabernacle is a picture of Christ. And the worship. And, and God dealt with them in a unique sense through the priesthood and the sacrificial system that praised God that we have the ultimate sacrifice, right? Yes. Jesus. God made promises that he made to no other nation. And Israel had unique, uh, intimate access to God, you know, through the temple, through, through God's presence, dwelling with him in the Holy of Holies, right? And, and even the showbread and just the Passover lamb, all these things. And tenth. And you might want to turn your Bible with this one. This might be the last point we cover. There might be one more. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 12. I was so excited. We were talking about some of this thing in men's group last week, and uh, and, and a younger fellow from Elliston. He, when I was kind of asking some questions, he 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 talked about this. He's like, "Yeah," he says, "It's back in Genesis," and uh, he even knew the chapter. And it was like awesome, man. I said, "Praise God!" I was so excited. Genesis chapter twelve. Thinking about this permanent ownership of the land. We'll start reading in verse 12, 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Then chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord, and the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. God is the owner, creator of the world, beloved. And in many ancient cultures, whoever creates something is the owner, and the owner can do with it as he pleases. And who created the earth? God. Who created man? God. Who decreed and wanted us to be born? God. He's our owner. He's got the right. He's got the land and he can give it to who he wants. And he said, the land of Israel, what you see, Abraham, I'm giving it to you. And the land they occupy today is nothing compared to what the biblical 
boundaries were. It was way bigger. Yeah. Okay? Let's see. If you don't like these verses, let's go to chapter 15, 18 through 21. Maybe you don't believe these first two. Okay. The boundaries of the land. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. Have I given it. Past tense. He said it once. It's a done deal. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the great Euphrates. So in other words, from uh, you know the Sinai Peninsula is included all the way over to the uh, into ancient Babylon or modern day Iraq. And part of Iran too. That'll make people happy, won't it? <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Yeah. The Kenites, the, Ken, the Kenzites, and the Cabanites, and the Hittites, this is the land they have, okay? Perizzites, and the Rephaim, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. A lot of sites in there, but people living in those communities and those areas, God said, that's your land. That's your land. Last one I got us to, 17.8. And I will give unto thee, and thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a sojourner, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Why does Israel fight for their land? Because God gave it to them. They're the apple of his eye. God established his unique relationship with Israel forever. And did God know the church age was coming? Yes. Absolutely. Because he knows everything, right? King David even said in, in 2 Samuel 7, 23 and 24, I'll read, And what nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great and terrible things for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. For thou hast confirmed to thyself a people Israel to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Lord, art become their God. Israel has a unique relationship with God. That's our message today. Because God wants that relationship with them. And people, God wants a unique relationship with you. He wants a unique relationship with us. He wants us to know that he loves us with an everlasting love. And that he sent his only begotten son into the world to die for our sins. So that if we'll trust in Christ, if we'll come to him, Jesus says, if, you know, if you come to me, I won't turn you away. If you need Christ as Savior, if you need your sins forgiven, today is the day to ask Jesus to be your Savior. And, and, and you won't have necessarily the same promises exactly as Israel, but I'm telling you, you're, you're going to be blessed by those promises. And God's got a whole slew of promises waiting for you, right? Amen. He says, because I will pour my spirit into you permanently. I will give you some of my love and some of my joy and some of my peace and some of my patience and, and I will change you into a person you thought you could never be if you'll come to me in faith. And he says, if you are one of my children, then I want you to walk faithfully, right? And I want you to confess your sins. I want you to be holy because I'm holy. That, that hasn't went away. We're supposed to be a... a and the Israelites are supposed to be a peculiar people. You know, I know some of you pretty good, getting to know some of you better, but I think we're all pretty peculiar in our own way. <laughs> but let's be peculiar for Jesus. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. So let's close in prayer. <laughs> Father, we thank you that you have a plan for all eternity. And we thank you, Lord, that your plan included uh, the nation of Israel. Father, we pray for the conversion of Israel, for the people, the Israelites, not only those in the land, but those outside. We pray for the salvation of our friends and family. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, just give us opportunities to share our faith with people, and to tell our story, because we know um, when people get challenged about eternity lord that it will open up the door for your spirit to work in them as we share scripture with people it will open up the door of their hearts and minds for the holy spirit to work because 
if the Spirit doesn't work on them, and if your word doesn't get into them, Lord, they won't get saved. And Lord, we don't know who you're going to save and who you're not going to save, but we know that salvation begins and ends with you, but in some crazy way you want to use us. So Lord, help us to be available to be used. And help us to be faithful. And help us to be kind people. And help us to be willing to meet people's needs. Help us to be that salt and light, that candle on a hill that burns bright. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise and glory. And God's people all said, Amen. Amen. All right.